I'm getting deja vu. Haven't we done this before? Every sequel about sequels we make makes my head hurt a little more. <laughs> Is it hypocritical to make a series like this? Who knows. But for now, I'll press on and like the best of the worst movie makers, I'll make do with very little tying it all together. It still amazes me how far studios are willing to stretch certain ideas. You would think after a little while there'd be no life left in a franchise. But with horror, I guess lifelessness doesn't really count for much, does it? Bring it back from the dead again, it doesn't matter. Dance for me, monkey. If people like a villain enough, they will pay every time. And that's been banked on since the golden age of movie monsters. Unfortunately, as the money becomes more easily guaranteed, people are likely to put less work in. The fact that there are 8 Nightmare on Elm Streets, 11 Friday the 13th, and 13 Halloweens blows my mind. You figure someone would try something different eventually or put the series to rest, but it is incredible how far a name can carry you. In the end, it does make for some good conversation. Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today we're taking a look at a video that creates a trilogy. The Top 5 Scary Horror Movies with Terrible Sequels Part 3 Take a deep breath, find a straw for your soda, and maybe have a different movie on standby because these are true stinkers. Before we get going, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more sinking sequels. Wicked. Let's get started. Kicking us off at number 5, we have The Howling 3, The Marsupials. Yeah, we'll start with a little throwback to our last video. I've tried not to use the same franchise twice in this series, but this one is too good? Bad? To pass up? The first Howling took place in California, the second in Czechoslovakia, and now we're on the sunny shores of Australia. Okay, it's more set in the outback, not the shores, but I thought it sounded nice. As if Australia didn't have enough men-eating deadly beasts, we can add another to the list. Marsupial werewolves. Yep. Lycanthropes with pouches for their young. It's actually quite touching seeing the idea of family take the lead. Unsurprisingly and unfortunately, Christopher Lee did not return for this one. Somehow, even after watching his last movie, director Philippe Mora didn't switch up the werewolf designs much. We've got more Halloween store style beasts, this time with the addition of a pouch for their wee bebés. What is new and exciting though is the addition of a werewolf birthing scene. Yes, we get to see a baby baby werewolf exit its mother and then crawl up to the pouch. The whole bit reminded me a bit of Cronenberg's Shivers, which is something. The plot is convoluted to say the least. A real Australian werewolf gets cast in a bad American werewolf movie. Whether they're making fun of their own production or just finding an excuse to make it even cheesier, I can't say for sure. Jerboa, our werewolf lead, meets a strapping young lad and they do what young folks do in horror movies. This leads to a werewolf pregnancy and she has to head back to her secret wolfy hometown in the outback. Flow. Yes, this is a goblin is nilbog spelt backwards situation. I'll let you figure that one out. After giving birth, she runs off with the boyfriend, avoiding the werewolf hunting government squads. This leads to some outrageous action sequences including werewolf skeletons being torn apart by machine guns and a rocket launcher causing a disproportionately large explosion. I also haven't mentioned yet that there's a Russian ballerina werewolf and the fact that strobe lights force werewolves to transform. Which is great to know, but puts our young actress in a difficult situation. I'm not sure if this is worse or better than The Howling 2. Maybe they're equally bad in their own special way. Coming in at number 4, we have Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. Part 9 of the ever popular Friday the 13th series, this is probably the strangest of the bunch. In fact, some might argue that it was only made because they wanted to kill time while Wes Craven worked on the new nightmare. In fact, some might argue that it was only made because they wanted to kill time while Wes Craven worked on a new nightmare. Freddy vs Jason was in the cards, but it wasn't ready to happen quite yet. However, this was quite different than the majority of other Friday the 13th flicks. Sure, we open on the classic scene, a naked girl at Camp Crystal Lake about to be killed by Jason. Psych! It's a sting! The FBI was waiting for him to appear and then they blow him the f up. 
Now Jason's dead and we're not even 10 minutes into the movie. So where do we go from here? Why not have the coroner eat his blackened, still beating heart and spawn a screaming demon tube to forcibly possess all sorts of different folks? Sure, who needs Jason anyways? So we go on, watching this phallic freak jump from orifice to orifice, having different people kill each other and random folks along the way. It's soon revealed that if Jason is the last living Voorhees, he'll essentially be immortal. So the creepy crawler goes to find Jason's half sister and her daughter. It does find and kill Diane, and then crawls into her corpse through an orifice I won't mention out loud, but then is stabbed by Jessica, her daughter. Fun fact, Jessica is played by Carrie Keegan. No relation. Then, as the title implies, Jason goes to hell. There are plenty of cool bits in this movie, but the stuff that doesn't work really overwhelms these. There's a skeezy tabloid reporter, a whole bunch of mediocre self-reference, and a bit where Jason's latest puppet strips down a cop before shaving his mustache and then possessing him. Seems like those first two steps were unnecessary, and that mustache bit hits a little too close to home, okay? In the end, it's obviously setting up for something new, but they should have just left it alone until Freddy cleared his schedule. Coming in at number three, Jeepers Creepers 3. Fifteen years after the second in the cult hit series, we got a largely disappointing follow up. Or rather, follow in? It's an interquel, you know? The, the events take place between 1 and 2. Kind of like Lion King 1.5, but a lot more gruesome. Fifteen years of development hell doesn't usually bode well for a project. Just think about Duke Nukem Forever and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Plus, there was plenty of controversy surrounding the project, with the director being convicted of a crime involving one of his young actors, and realistically, should have never been allowed on a movie set again. But. This is Hollywood after all. So we follow young Addie, who lives with her grandmother on a failing farm. It's revealed that her uncle fell victim to the creeper at some point in the past, but before he died he had a super mega important relic that never gets properly explained. There's also a local militia determined to take down the winged demon, armed with a truck mounted chain gun. The harpoon was cooler. Oh, and the creeper also has a magical booby trapped truck now. Don't worry about it too much. The plot is basically... Let's go get this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which means a lot of dumb stuff happens. The whole flick just seems to be very poorly thought out. These creeper killing militants are really, really bad at killing the creeper, which is surprising considering how knowledgeable they're implied to be. Addie is pretty ineffectual as a protagonist, and the creeper itself never really gets to spread its wings. Metaphorically, I mean. Its wings literally do spread during the movie, but it never reaches its full potential. You get what I'm saying. In the end, Jeepers Creepers 3 just kind of fizzles, failing on all attempts to live up to its predecessors. Coming in at number 2, Critters 3. So. Sport. You are what they eat. Clever. Critters did what plenty of horror movies do when they run out of ideas. They move to the big city. It seems like a no-brainer, you know? Densely populated areas to terrorize, dark alleyways, inept police forces. But it's harder to pull off than one might think, as evidenced by Jason Takes Manhattan and Leprechaun 2. These country folk just don't know what to do in the urban sprawl. They're used to unlocked cabins and dark tree-filled areas. Unfortunately, Critters is another example of a flick that just can't handle the concrete jungle. The series has never been prestige filmmaking, but it's always been fun. Number three kind of biffs it though. The filmmaking just seems totally lazy, leading to the comedy that never really lands, and lighting everything really poorly and passing it off as city style, and they rarely move the camera in interesting ways either. Barely anyone dies in it too. Charlie McFadden, the famous critter hunter, is on the road again tracking the beasts. He runs into a small family, a scummy landlord father, a spirited and resourceful daughter, and Leonardo DiCaprio. Yep, it was Leo's first feature. Kind of like how Jennifer Aniston got her start on Leprechaun. So the family accidentally brings some of the critters home with them out of their car, and the spherical lunatics terrorize their apartment complex. This leads to some ridiculous setups, like the consumption of a skeezy maintenance worker, and a flimsy trash can rolling down the stairs and sending critters flying like it was the boulder from Indiana Jones. There's even a bit where the intergalactic Space Force shows up in the basement. This was a direct to video venture, so you can't expect too much, but Critters 3 definitely misses every target. And finally, at number one, we've got Book of Shadows Blair Witch 2. Sweet. Yo, Morticia. Hey, Elvira, I got something you can suck the blood out of. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sure, sequels tend to be put out pretty quickly after initial success. You gotta make sure you strike while the iron's hot, right? But Blair Witch 2 is on a whole other level of quick. It came out one year after the first. This definitely sounds like a recipe for disaster, but you know, it made millions, so no, nobody's crying themselves to sleep. However, if given a little extra time, this movie could have actually been good. It's more disappointing than anything. Joe Berlinger was brought on to direct what he thought was gonna be a plethora of interesting ideas. He wanted to make it a commentary on mass hysteria and kind of a meta commentary on the success of the first movie. Found footage was avoided, which was an interesting choice to separate the flick from its forebearer, and it was put into our universe as opposed to the Blair Witch's universe. Like all the main characters in Book of Shadows are fans of the original Blair Witch movie, so they all go to visit the location of the events from the first and begin going slowly insane. The characters are clearly unstable from the get go, and then when weird stuff starts to happen it's hard to tell whether it's real or in their heads. If left alone, this could have been a very interesting slow burning descent into madness. But the studio stepped in claiming that it wouldn't go over well with audiences. Classic. So the filmmakers tried to do something cool and meta with a tense build up and crazy payoff, but the studio decided there wasn't enough obvious on screen killing. So random scenes of murders with nothing to do with the main cast were inserted along with assorted jump scares and a new score. It was also re-edited, but I'm not sure how much of a difference that made. The whole thing fell to pieces. Watching it now, it's painfully obvious that it could have been so much better. But with the rushed release of something so different from the original, audiences didn't know how to react. Adding studio changes as an afterthought made it seem too toned and stilted, and the rest is publicly decried history. So there you have it. Five more fumbles with plenty more out there. What did you think? Are there any others that deserve a spot on this list of infamy? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's have a look at some of your more stifling ones from top 5 scary pirate ghosts who haunt the seas. Jake Smith says, yo Keegan, John Carpenter's The Fog, man. You literally just described The Fog in number 1. Think The Thing meets another John Carpenter movie. Pirates of the Caribbean, man, come on. Well, I appreciate the aesthetics and carpenterness of Antonio Bay. I was thinking of something more adventurous. We don't see much of the seven seas through the eyes of Adrian Barbo, although she could narrate any story and keep my attention. George Newell says, jerked meat. Real mature, Bradley. Kazuma Kun says, where is Cervantes, my main from Soul Calibur? He's busy fighting all the ungodly abominations folks made in Soul Calibur 6. The lad has his hands full with enough big membered lizards and Shrek clones to last a lifetime. Liam the God asks, where do you find this stuff? Hmm. Under the fridge, mostly, along with all the ice cubes I kicked under there. Lemire Lau says, y'all gotta stop with the scary background music. It's scaring TF out of me, lol. I'll see what I can do, but something tells me that bright, cheerful tunes won't go over too well on the channel. And that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. He runs into a small family. A scummy landlord fodder. Fodder? Oh my goodness. Hello, mother. This is mother? Yeah. Hello, fodder. <laughs> Here I am in <laughs> Camp Granada. Man! Sentences are hard, okay? I'll just, I'll do the whole song now, you know? I'll, beginning to end, I'll read the letter. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've lost it.